everybody, and welcome to this episode of the I Hate Matt Wall podcast, where today I'm going to see if I can finally exorcise my demons and have a conversation about poetry that doesn't make me mad. Might be a little difficult today since apparently the city is doing construction in the street again. And I thought it was going to be done soon, but that was at 7 o'clock, and it is now 11, and they are still going. So, let's get into this, because the last time I tried to do this episode, I only got six minutes in to the podcast in which we are going to be talking about today. So, let's just start off by saying... Yes, you are allowed to go over to iTunes and give this podcast five stars. Yes, you are allowed to give this podcast an amazing review. I will appreciate it and also be okay with you doing that. In other news, I want to give a big thank you to all the motherfuckers who make the show possible. So I want to give a big thank you to all you folks over on the Patreon want to give a big thank you to to michael to deborah to cedar to harry i want to thank the people in the youtube thank you crew so that would be patrick and brit and jh and jan over in the anarchy crew the big swingers i want to give a thank you to bunny to nate to mindy to thomas to josh to jessica to shaylin to tim to Tamara and to Chill Baby. And for the biggest thank yous in the world, that goes to the Chappies over in the Chat Book of the Month Club. And that would be thank you to Caitlin and thank you to Chase. You guys are awesome. And since we're here, I also want to give an extra thank you to those of you who are making your mom proud, making your mom happy, who are over there on the Indiegogos giving support to winner of your mom's Sodomy Prize for Poetry, which is my new poetry book that is roughly 150 pages, over 60 poems, great stuff. Um, And you can find all the cool tiers and perks if you go to igg.me slash at your mom. And there will be links down below. But I want to give a big thank you to Caitlin, to JH, to Bunny, to Shaylin, to Deb, to Chase, and to Mindy. We are at... Let me see here. So we have seven backers now. And we are at $385. So thank you guys for that. We have 16 days left. I think we can do it. I don't know about you guys. The last 10 days of a campaign are like punching fuckers in the face so i think we'll we'll be able to do this i think it'll i think it'll work out okay so go over to igg.me slash at slash your mom to find out more and to find out how you can help make your mom's dreams come true that was lovely so now on with the schlow So today, and I'm going to play this so fucking adult and so fucking cool. You guys are, after after you hear this, you guys are going to be saying to yourself, God, Matt has really matured. And you will be right. I've done a lot of growing in the last um, few weeks. And there's not even a that's what she said joke there. I feel like I'm going to be yelling over the top of all the madness outside, even though I know that this microphone's really good and probably won't pick up a lot of it. I should have my headphones on, but maybe I should just put the fucking headphones on. This episode is going to be my rebuttal to the... I don't know if I'm going to do the whole two episodes that they did, but um, over on a podcast called Versecraft, um, hosted by a dude named Elijah... He did two episodes called The Case for Meter and Rhyme. And I had huge problems with a lot of the stuff that he was saying. And not just because of the stuff that he was saying, but because of the ongoing issue 
that things like this bring up in the poetry community. Okay? My biggest thing has been if formal poets would stop talking about free verse poets like they have since frickin' forever and complaining about it and complaining about it and saying we're better than you and da 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 if they would just stop this wouldn't even be an issue no one would give them any thought whatsoever except the people who like that stuff for the people who like that stuff that is the stuff they like and that's fine why because art is subjective i've said this a million times okay so if you like meter and rhyme good i hope you love it hard but you don't need to trash free verse poetry while you love that other thing you know what i'm saying so and through this whole thing, he's going to keep saying that he's not doing exactly what he's doing. But um, we'll see how this goes. Hopefully I could... I, I got a little heated there all of a sudden. So we're going to see how, how well I could do this. Let's see how well this works. I'm Elijah Blumoff, and you're listening to Versecraft, a podcast about the art of poetry seen through the craft of particular poems. In each episode... An exceptional piece of verse. This podcast. Couple things right off the bat. Of course, as soon as I hit play, the biggest truck on God's green earth decides to try to drive up the hill right here and then stop right under my window so a bulldozer could drop a giant piece of asphalt into it. Okay? Apologies there. Second, Elijah has a lovely voice. So, good on you. For keeping those pipes clean, bro. Sounds good. <laughs> so frustrating. So I'm going to be pausing this a lot. Because in just the first six minutes of this episode, I have tons to argue with and to talk about. So let's go. In the course of this episode and the next, I hope to answer a vital question that faces the working poet. The question I'm not going to ask is, which is the superior practice? <laughs> okay, so here's the thing. And he's talking about a question that is, like, really troubling the working poet, you know? But he doesn't tell you what that is right away. He tells you what he's not going to do. And what he's not going to do is tell you what the superior practice is, okay? Why is that not what he's going to do? Because the spoiler alert is, is that he does basically tell you that in his own words with his essay here okay the other thing that's funny about this is that he's talking about the working poet okay a working poet is someone who makes money from poetry all right so if you're trying to answer a question for the working poet the answer will be whatever you can make the most money on because you are a working poet whatever can make you be able to pay the rent whatever can make you be able to pay the bills whatever can put food on your table wine in your glass and prostitutes on your lap like whatever you're into okay if you are a working poet your goal right there based on that title is making money okay it's not hobby it's not hobby town okay we're talking working poet and i'm going to give you a another little spoiler here formal poetry is not popular it is popular in a small group of people who really like that stuff and again i appreciate the fact that there's people who champion that shit and love it that is a great thing for them but just because you love something doesn't mean that everyone else has to love something just because you love something doesn't mean you have to spend the rest of your life trying to prove to me that i'm wrong about something okay the, the, it's just like what you do in your bedroom is your business okay the poetry you write is your business the poetry you read is your business 
Why? Because art is subjective. Okay. But if we're going to talk about making money, the last thing any working poet should do is write formal poetry because it doesn't sell. There's like almost no market for it. So the working poet should stay the hell away from formal poetry. So uh, like that's not the question that he's not going to ask, if that makes sense here, based on his words. But that's just something to think about. The question I'm not going to ask is, which is the superior practice? metrical or non-metrical poetry to answer this question absolutely one way or the other is to be guilty of rash generalization okay so to answer this question in one way or the other is to be guilty of rash generalization but in what he does over these next two episodes is exactly what he says he's not going to do so maybe in his mind he's like but if i do these two episodes very long-winded about all this stuff it won't be a rash generalization. Maybe that's his thinking. Because like some of the people who I've talked to about this episode are going, oh, he's not saying that. He's not saying that formal poetry is better. That's exactly what he's saying. That's exactly what he's saying. This is called a case for meter and rhyme. It's not called, like, let's hold hands and like go frolic in a meadow. You know what I'm saying? Like, it's very fucking clear what he's what he's saying here. Instead, I'd like to answer a related but more subtle question. Namely, which of the two, metrical or free verse, carries the burden of proof? Okay, this cracks me <laughs> This cracks me up so much. This is a related question. Because he says it's a related question. Which one of these things carries the burden of proof? Because I know that all of you, like when you were going, God, what's better, like free verse or uh, formal poetry? I just, oh, God, it's just, there's, there, uh, you know what? I got it. it. It's it's not that question, but it is related. It is probably the next question that we would all ask ourselves. Which one carries the burden of proof? This is fascinating. What does that mean? Well, first we must assume, and it's a large assumption, that the poet's ultimate artistic objective is to create the highest quality work of which they're capable. Okay, so right here, he's, to me, whenever someone starts an argument by saying, okay, now in order for this to work, we have to assume, okay, and it's a big assumption. He even said it's a big assumption. We have to assume Right there, like, this is bad. Like, this, no good is going to come out of this. Well, first we must assume, and it's a large assumption, that the poet's ultimate artistic objective is to create the highest quality work of which they're capable. Now, as soon as all of this is said, we're immediately passing judgment on this. So, one of my biggest arguments with formalist poets is that they try to, and they will argue me, this and that's fine but they try to treat an art like a science it's not a science it's an art and if poetry is an art it should be treated as an art this is where we get the whole like beauties in the eye of the beholder like different things mean different things to different people you know so if I decide that the best, my highest artistic achievement or whatever can be made with like my, whatever the fuck he just said. If I decided that doing that was me smearing shit on the side of a Buick, then, and write a poem in my shit on the side of a Buick, and that was my highest artistic everything he would not be able to argue that do you see what i'm saying what he's actually saying is in order for this to make sense i have to approve of what you're gonna do and this is the kind of crap that the formalist fucking poets academia critics whatever and i i wouldn't even throw critics into that fucking category but just that type of poet, that type of 
No, critic. I have to throw critics in there. Because he's making himself a critic right now. It's absolute garbage. Nothing that he says here is an absolute. Although, by the time we get to the end of this whole thing, he will be speaking in absolutes. Now, my favorite part of this whole thing is the next thing he says. Poets with other ultimate artistic objectives I'm not concerned with here. Poets with other artistic objectives I'm not concerned with here. That's very fucking condescending, first off, the way that is said. But it's funny because he's basically saying anyone who could disprove what I'm about to say, I'm not concerned with because you do not matter to me in my argument. I I don't want to attack this dude personally. Like, he's just making content, you know? I can't, I can't, like, fucking torch a fucker for making content, you know? But it is very condescending, and it shows how, like, much he really believes in what he's going to say right now if he can't, like, defend his fucking argument. <laughs> like, he's, he's basically saying, if you disagree with what I'm saying and disagree with my premise, like, I, I can't talk to you. So now, for the next hour, listen to me make my point. And again, what is the highest artistic anything? That is a judgment. If I say everything I fucking do is the highest fucking artistic achievement, what can he say to that? Can he say no? Sure he can. Does he have a right to? Of course not. He could say he doesn't like it. That's fine. I didn't write it for you. The way he speaks is the way this invisible poetry mafia speaks. And he is speaking on this podcast to other people who already agree with him. Okay, so he's doing this for backpats. Like, this isn't like a thing where he's like, oh, this is going to be really dicey. I'm going out into a world where people aren't going to be hip on this idea, everyone who listens to his show, for the most part, is going to be like, bro, high five. You said it perfectly, man. I totally agree with you. Okay? Now, I'm listening to it, and I'm, like, railing against it, but he didn't know that was going to happen. Maybe he hoped it would. I don't know. But if I was going to do something that I hope people would come at me for, I would work a little harder on that beginning. (laughs) Okay, let's see what he has to say. Now, for those poets who do seek to create the best work possible. The best work possible. By whose definition? It's so fucking stupid. It's so up their own ass. There are so many formal poets in the world. I I, I wouldn't say so many. There are a number of formal poets in the world. And all of these formal poets who do all the formal poet things, guess what they do? They complain and bitch about each other's work. This is good. This is crap. This is good. This is shit. But if they're making the best possible work, how can it be bad? Is that an assumption? That because you do these things, that automatically it has to be good? You know what's even funnier? There are going to be people in these groups, in this eratosphere of poets some will like some poems and others will not like those poems well that doesn't make any fucking sense by you saying that it sounds like art is subjective and we can't have that this is a fucking objective fucking medium damn it it's fucking weird okay let's hear what he has to say the question quickly becomes which method of composition will enable me to produce my best work in the quest to find the ideal method, Whatever you want. the poet comes at once to a crossroads. Metrical or non-metrical composition. Or they never approach that crossroads because nobody gives a shit. And you do what you do because you do it. That's it. Now, immediately my listener will protest. I am. I choose either or. And of course it's true that you never have to commit exclusively to one form of writing. And if your sole focus is creating the best poem possible in every circumstance, you shouldn't. However, if what we desire is... Okay, you cannot say that you should not do something and then follow it with however. That is some political fucking bullshit. You cannot 
say this absolute, but blah, 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 blah. However, if what we desire is excellence above all, we will seek to discover a method of composition that will dependably offer up excellence above all. By whose fucking measurement? So Elijah writes poems, okay? So my question for Elijah, how has this worked out for you? Every poem you write, is it the best? Every poem you write, is it excellence above all? If not, your whole fucking thing here does not stand. It holds no water. It is a bucket with a hole in the bottom. You are saying that to write the best poetry, to have excellence, all you have to do is do the things that you're going to say next. But if you have not accomplished this, you are full of lies. We will seek to discover a method of composition that will dependably offer us the most powerful, versatile tools of expression. Once we've discovered this method, while we will not commit to it dogmatically, it will require an exceptional situation for us to break from it. This is proof comes in. So, he just said, once you find this thing that is so great, which apparently he doesn't know what it is yet, and we're going to wrestle with him until we find this out, you can break away from it. But you have to come up with a really fucking good reason. And this is where the burden of proof comes in. Of these two mutually exclusive practices, metrical and non-metrical composition, one of them, based on the plentitude of its strengths and the deficit of its weaknesses, ought to be rationally preferred as the soundest method for composition. The standard method. Okay, so he's trying to find a standard method. And if you're trying to find something that does not have any weaknesses... Free verse does not have any weaknesses because there are no rules. The only weakness you can find is if you are doing metrical poetry and you fuck it up. You, your weakness is you're not very good at that. That's your weakness. So if all you're trying to find is a way to write poetry that will not have weaknesses, you fucked up right off the bat. You were two and a half minutes in. You don't have to do any more of this podcast. You figured it out. To break from the standard method will then require, in every case, justification, proof of concept, a compelling reason why the benefits of the standard method are being sacrificed in a given instance. That which deviates from the standard method carries the burden of proof. What is truly astounding to consider is that for thousands of years, there was worldwide consensus on what the standard method should be. Okay, so this is really interesting. For thousands of years, there was a standard worldwide for what this should be. So, to let you guys in on another spoiler, not every form of poetry from everywhere in the world was the same. So he's just talking broad brush strokes here that it was kind of sing-songy, okay? Which is fine, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. But he's going to now list off a bunch of places that all of these things were the same. Now, hopefully, he's only going to mention places that are above reproach over all of these years. Because it would be kind of silly if he started naming places that had questionable pasts. Because what he's saying right now is because these places did this way back when, we should still do those things. That's his argument. That the past is better because it's been done longer. So let's see what places he says. On a planet of such variety, such drastic cultural difference, there was worldwide consensus. From ancient Greece to ancient Israel to ancient China. From medieval England to medieval Persia to medieval India. From Germany to Japan to Java, all poetic traditions use some form of meter. By meter, I mean a principle of sound which organizes language into repeating sonic patterns that can be varied for expressive effect. Sonic patterns. Okay, we'll, we'll talk about that too. Okay, so this is the argument I fucking hate. And I think he actually talks about this later, but um, and we'll get into it again when he gets into it. But to say like because all of these places a long time ago did this stuff we should also do it is silly because if that's your argument why don't we do all the things that all of these places were doing years and years and years ago it's a stupid argument 
Because it's just like, well, why not? Why don't we do these things? It's astounding. For years, this happened. Great. It's still happening now. You're still writing stuff like that. So who fucking cares? It's astounding that it bothers you so much that other people write free verse poetry. It's astounding that it keeps you up at night. That other people are having fun. It's astounding. That's that's really what this is. That's crazy. From the dawn of civilization up until the early 20th century, and even well into the 20th century, verse was the standard method of poetic composition. In Europe alone, it was the method used for most literature in general up until the 18th century, a mere 300 years ago. It was a truth universally acknowledged by nearly all cultures through all times that when it came to writing the most powerful and concentrated language, whether it be for lyrics, dramas, or narratives, verse was the most, most effective medium. In the course of this essay, I hope to demonstrate why this consensus existed. There's a lot there. What Elijah is leaving out here, not everyone knew how to read. Not everyone was literate. For thousands of years, a lot of stories and things like this had to be passed down by someone telling it to somebody else. And then that person remembers it and tells it to somebody else. We know that when you do things that give something a cadence, something a rhythm, when there is some way to make something easier to remember, it's easier to remember. Okay? So, for thousands of years, I can understand why a lot of people did that. Because it made it easy. It made it accessible. It made it to where anyone could hear it and learn it. Okay? For the first time in history, Sometimes between the 1920s and the 1960s, this consensus, and by extension the burden of proof, was flipped on its head. The standard method of poetry is now asserted to be prose, and anyone who dares continue writing in meter is now obligated to explain themselves. Bro, I'm giving you permission right now. You never have to explain yourself if you want to write in verse. I don't care. Free verse poets don't care. Magazines that publish formal poems don't care nobody fucking cares you can do whatever the fuck you want it's not going to hurt anyone's feelings you are not obligated any longer to think that you need to defend yourself for doing something that nobody cares about nobody cares at all okay The other thing that um, cracks me up about formalist poets is that they, like, completely lose their shit about the fucking 1920s. You know, like, the fucking modernists, dude. They fucking ruined everything for everybody. These fucking assholes. Okay? And then, like, it's so funny because... Then, like, the Beats continued this, but they hardly ever talk about the Beats. Because I think to them, if the modernists weren't there to fuck this up in the first place, the Beats would have never existed. And so they just, like, instead of, like, actually looking at different periods and what people actually did, we're just going to blame the modernists. It's hysterical. Even more shocking than the fact that an understanding so universal and so stable could be overturned is the fact that this upheaval was entirely due to the influence of a mere handful of disaffected white men in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. Now here here again, he's trying to say that he doesn't have a dog in this fight, okay? And he's just like looking to, like, what's, you know, for the working poet, what's the, what's the, what, what form, what type of poetry carries the burden of proof? And then he says all of this shit that, like, shows his hand completely. He's pissed. Like, he, he can't fucking believe this. It is, like, blowing his mind that this even fucking happened. And it was just a handful of fucking stupid white guys that, like, I don't know, couldn't get published elsewhere. Whatever his argument is. Okay, so he obviously cares a lot 
about this. Okay, it's obviously a big fucking deal to him. But what I want to kind of throw out there as to another reason why um, his precious poetry is like disappearing. Okay, and again, this cracks me up, and it cracks me up that people who were into formalist poetry don't ever understand this and i honestly think it's a class thing like <laughs> what else happened in the 20s and 30s what other things went down around this time let's see there was the uh the great depression okay that was a thing what else did we have we had uh the Dust Bowl. That, that was kind of a big fucking deal. Um, okay, alright. And we had... Um, like, the only people who were getting educations at this time were people who could afford educations. Okay? So, the only people who would be benefiting from this wonderful formal verse are people who might not be affected a whole lot by things like the Depression and the Dust Bowl. Okay? So, the, these people who have now been affected by this, they're, they're not digging none of this stuff. Okay? A, because books are fucking expensive. Okay? And before uh, 1949, you couldn't get inexpensive paperbacks of first run books like all books were hardcover and it was an industry standard and once a book sold a ton of hardcovers and had been around for a really long time then they would release these little like paperback editions that were cheap okay so before this we have all these people who can't afford a book all right but the other thing we do have is something that's brand new and it's like hitting everywhere. What is it? Radio. Radio. What goes on the radio? Yeah, there were people who like talked on the radio and poets who read their poems on the radio. That's fun. But you know what else there was? Music on the radio. Okay. So now all these people who needed to get their mind off of stuff, needed to, like, unwind, relax, chill, like, have some quality of life, could suddenly have a radio in their home and just listen to music. That's a big deal. That's a big thing. And then, around this time, too, very inexpensive instruments were coming out. Okay, they were being mass produced pretty much like at least America wise for the first time. Now why is this? Why why were these things being mass produced? Because radio made music popular. Record labels needed more people making music so they could put out more records. So instruments became very cheap. And now someone who doesn't know how to read or write can, like, go to his neighbor's house and everyone's sitting on the porch playing music, could pick up a guitar, learn how to play it. And now suddenly they're playing guitar. Now all of those dudes that used to make chicks drop their panties by reciting verse, now we're making them drop their panties because they could sing a song and play guitar. And guess where people went at night? They went to these places where people were playing music and people were having drinks. And it was fun. You want to know why? Because people were cutting loose and having sex. Sex is another big reason why verse, metrical verse poetry, is not popular. You had people on the brink of extinction. And you're worried about why people aren't fucking, like, kowtowing to the wealthy elite who are reading verse poetry? It's, 
It's so stupid. And the fact that whenever you talk to formal poets, they never look at economics. They never look at what was the world like when this happened. They bitch about the modernists. That ruined everything. But here's, I'm going to say something else to this. And like, I have been hard on T.S. Eliot for a very long time, and I still feel the same way, okay? But it wasn't T.S. Eliot's fault as much as it was the publishers that put his stuff out and the media who pushed his stuff. It's everything is involved in this. Publishers want to make money. That's their whole purpose. Publishers' like purpose, especially back then, was not this altruistic, like, I, I want to make society better. It was, let's make as much money as humanly freaking possible. And if you want to argue that with me, <laughs> show me someone's business plan where back from however long ago that was like, you know, we don't really care if we're making any money. We just want to get art out to the public. So if you want to start complaining and bitching about some of this stuff, maybe you should go after the publishers who were putting out this stuff and pricing it out of range for the majority of Americans. That might be something to look into. Far from common sense or enlightened progress, the current dominance of prose in the world of poetry can best be regarded as a historical aberration, a freak accident that has cut off the current world of poetry from its entire lineage. The overwhelming popularity of music with rhyming lyrics, and especially the explosion of hip-hop music in recent decades, is proof, however, that rhythm and rhyme are basic pleasures of the human animal. And when that need can't be supplied by poetry, the public will look elsewhere, to poetry's detriment. Florentine farmers used to recite Dante to pass the time, what average blue-collar worker today would even dream of reciting a contemporary poem to bring themselves relief from their labor? The popularity and influence that a figure like Dante used to command has been almost completely transferred to the M&Ms and Kendrick Lamars of the world. The socio-cultural reasons why the prose revolution occurred are beyond the scope of this essay, but I would recommend the curious reader to check out Timothy Steele's excellent study of this question, entitled Missing Measures. Missing Measures. For I'm sure that goes into everything we talked about, especially since he's now talking about Eminem and Kendrick Lamar, because, you know, 1920, Kendrick Lamar. Got it. It's it's a straight line. It makes perfect sense. You know, because hip-hop, people, people like rhyme because of hip-hop, because there wasn't music in between um, T.S. Eliot and the Sugar Hill Gang. It, it's... Oh my god. Purposes, I'm interested only in comparing the transhistorical value of prose and verse as poetic methods. I'd like to begin in this episode by examining the case for prose as the standard method for poetic composition. What is usually in a poetic context called free verbs, but free verse is a term that is so blatantly oxymoronic that I can't use it in good conscience. A spade is a spade, oh. and prose is prose. If you want to start talking a spade as a spade, dude, I could call you out on a ton of stuff right now because you've shown your hand on a lot of things. So let's just leave that where that lays there. But here's the deal. <clears throat> the term free verse is oxymoronic to him. That he just, he can't even bring himself to say it. Well, I, I will explain why this is called this okay because you can do whatever you want you are free to do whatever you want to do you have freedom to do whatever you want to do with the verse that you were writing on the page that is what free verse means and I don't want to start calling you names or saying anything like that but all of these like little snide remarks this is why People like me get really pissed. This is why people like me talk about this like formal poetry mafia. Saying snide stuff like this. Little snide comments. 
I could say snide comments too, but what's the point? You're still going to think the stupid things that you think. I'm still going to think the stupid things that I think. You think I'm wrong. I think you're wrong. And that's the thing. I don't even care what you think in the sense that you can do whatever you want. Your metrical poetry to me is free verse because you are free to do whatever the fuck you want with your verse. I don't care. Okay? But I do care when people start telling me what I can and cannot do with my verse. Do you see how this goes? It's oxymoronic to say this. A spade is a spade. Okay, I'm going to bring it down a little bit now because now I'm getting mad again. But I will say the other thing that pisses me off is um, this condescending shit where this guy is just saying poetry that is not sing-song is prose. It's just prose. Okay, well, me being a renaissance man, okay, me being a guy who's done everything and done it better than you, okay, I have written novels, I have written serials, I have written short stories, I have written flash fiction, I have written songs, and I have written poetry. And every single one of those things are completely fucking different from the other. And when you minimize it by just calling free verse poetry prose, it's fucking insulting. And it makes me want to go back to just saying what you do is craft poetry. Because there is no art in it. You have learned skills and you use those skills to fashion something. No art whatsoever. And you might be fine with that. So that's great. You could be happy with me being condescending to you, but I'm still going to be upset when you're condescending to me and what I do. Okay. And one of the things that um, got me so, like, my blood boiling is that I am my art. My art is everything to me. It means everything to me. I put my soul into it. I cut myself and bleed on the page. Okay. Whereas what you do is a hobby. So when you talk to me the way you do, I know you're not talking to me personally, but I'm a listener to your podcast right now. So when you say the things that you're saying, it's insulting. And it's hard for me not to take them personally. Because you do not look at poetry the way I do. You look at it as a thing you do. I look at it as a thing I am. That's the difference there. And that's what cracks me up even more, that this keeps you up at night. That free verse poets exist. That free verse poets are popular. That free verse poets make money. It drives you crazy. It's hysterical. Just do you. If all you want to do is formal poetry, then do you. And do it the best you can. As you lay out in here. This is the best way for excellence. Okay? So if that's how you do it, then do that and be happy with it. But if you can't even say free verse poetry, then just keep the whole thing out of your mouth, dude. It's a bad look. So I guess I'll just cut that there. Um, I don't know. I, I, so again, that was the first six minutes of his episode. And maybe I'll do more. I don't know. If you guys want me to do more, tell me you want me to do more and I'll do more. I feel a lot better about this. I feel like I was able to keep my cool which was really impressive for me. Like, this is like a big victory for me today. Guys, seriously. Man, you should have heard the other five times I recorded this episode. Ooh. All right, so, um, butt plug time. The only thing I'm going to tell you guys to do, your mom needs you, go to igg.me slash at slash your mom. 
Y-E-R-M-O-M. And go in there, find a tier you like, find the perks you like, secure your pre-order, and all the other stuff that comes with it, including my March chapbook runner-up that is only available for people who put money into the campaign. Okay? There's all sorts of stuff. Stickers, an 8x10 glossy of me on the can, the whole deal. Um, chat books, up the wazoo, audiobooks, uh, my other poetry collections. You know, there's just tons of stuff for you to take a look at here. All right. So with that said, make your mom proud. Type hard, everybody. Um, Elijah, thank you for the episode. Um, and maybe we'll be doing more of it. And until next time, everybody, I will talk to you all later. I just want to give a quick thanks to those people who make these videos possible. Anarchy Crew and my followers on Patreon. I appreciate the hell out of you guys. And thank you so much for keeping me going to keep this content possible. You guys are awesome. And if you'd like to join the crew or the Anarchy Crew, just hit the join button beneath this video. And if you'd like to become a member of my Patreon, you can run over to the link down below to do that as well. Thank you.